And so species can uh, divide their time between places that are safe and places that are luxuriant. You also have species which occupy different layers in a body of water. And the body of water is structured gradually as you go from the surface of a pond or a bay downward, the temperature gets cooler down to about 4 degrees Celsius. And then you have what's called the thermocline, it's a barrier. It doesn't get any colder when you go further down. And that's a barrier also for movements of things. So it's a different world down there in the four degree environment near the bottom. Uh, so is a spatial structure also horizontally. I referred to before the fact that a habitat uh, or the range of a species is a mosaic of habitats. In some places it does well and can reproduce. In other places it can just pass through. Other places are kind of mediocre. It reproduces, but not enough to sustain itself. And this is often the case with infection. But a pathogen can get into a patient, reproduce, build up to a certain level, and then the immune system comes into action and the invading species is eliminated. Now, from the point of view of ecology, this is unsuccessful invasion. From the point of view of medicine, in this intermediate phase, uh, before a species is eliminated from its habitat, it can kill you. And so it becomes important how quickly does a population become abundant, how quickly does it decline, what influences that. If the immune system takes a while to kick in, then you can regard the immune system as predators of a pathogen, but it's always chasing it and maybe not, not catching up. When we look at a geographic distribution, um, we see it first of all as a mosaic of habitats. Uh, then it was realized that in order, in order to persist, a species not only has to have habitats where it can reproduce, but it also has to be able to get from one to another. And so conservationists discovered that you cannot conserve a species by having a large number of small parks. And grizzly bears just won't do in small reserves because they're very much disturbed by human activity, by the noises of cars, even the flights of airplanes overhead. So there's a minimum size of an area that can maintain a species. Furthermore, you need corridors so they can get from one place to another. Elephants uh, have to be able to migrate. And uh, so a number of, in a number of places, Agreements have been made to establish ecological corridors. Uh, there's the, uh, the Pan American corridor. It's particularly important in small countries where uh, there's no way that a place like uh, El Salvador could put aside big enough forests to be able to maintain autonomous populations of tapirs and jaguars and such. So you need a large enough area where they can get from one place to another. Along the corridor, the habitat may not be sufficient for them to maintain populations, but it's sort of congenial enough so that they can temporarily live there, hunt for a while, find water, and then move on. In the case of agricultural pests, like the uh, golden, golden mosaic of beans, the, the vector uh, is a white fly. The white flies are highly mobile, but they're also fussy in their hab habits. Uh, they can feed on beans, but not reproduce there. They can transmit the virus to the beans. Uh, they can reproduce on uh, crops in the Malvaceae family, where the virus won't, won't take root. And so you get a mosaic of very different kinds of habitats. We have about half a dozen significant habitats in the mosaic from the point of view of the uh, being golden mosaic and its white fly vector. So this adds other dimensions to the complexity. You can see that it easily becomes overwhelming. So there are a number of different strategies 
One of these is that adopted by Tom Odom and his group at the uh, University of North Carolina and his brother doing similar work at the University of Georgia. They said, let's forget about species altogether. What's important about an ecosystem is the, trans the transfers of energy. And so Odom, who was very much influenced by engineering, did his diagrams based on engineering circuits. And he would use some symbols uh, like delays and resistance and so on. And he would say that the way to understand an ecosystem is to look at the flow of energy. And so any particular link, like the herbivores, would be represented by a single symbol, even though it involves lots of species. And this was given the name systems ecology. It became very common in some of the, the international biological programs, Utah State University, Colorado State. And it, it given, because it was given a different name, systems ecology, it was divided from community ecology, which looked at the relations among species. There was a kind of rivalry among them, and departments would hire somebody as a systems ecologist, uh, but we don't need a community ecologist or the other way around. And so this fragmented ecology, because the same, the same objects really were being looked at from different points of view. Then you can look at the whole geographic ranges of species. And uh, a lot of this work was developed in Russia in the 1920s, 20s and the early 30s. And so they, they, they used the term biosynosis, with the synosis referring to together. That referred to a community of coexisting species. Then they extended it geographically, and it became a biogeosynosis. That represented the whole range of species in, over geographic regions. And so you had to deal with climate gradients, uh, moisture, the rivers. And it was a geographic analysis. Once again, even though this, this is a highly complex system, there are things that it leaves out. For instance, if you represent the va as variables the species in the this, in this system, you're not taking into account that members of the same species might be different in different places genetically. They may be different in their nutrition and therefore in their body size. If they're different in their body size, they may be able to have different toleration for heat. They may be more or less mobile, have longer or shorter generations. So there are a lot of ecological characteristics that are often left out when we simply map uh, whole communities. So you can see that uh, life is complicated and gradually people began to recognize that complexity itself is the core intellectual problem of modern science. 